20, 40, whoops, 40, 60, and this in your ID, and you have a great day. Thank you. I can help the next person. How are you today, sir? Pretty good. I'd like to make a withdrawal from this account. Okay. I'm um, sorry, sir. It looks like there's nothing left in this account. Hmm. Are you sure? Well, I can double check. Thank you. I'm sorry, sir, but there's nothing left in this account. Yes! Imagine if you showed up at the bank to get a withdrawal and your money was all gone. <laughs> That'd be kind of a scary thing, wouldn't it? Well, in our new series, The Upside Down Christmas, Turning Your Christmas Upside Down, talking today about losing your money. And I have to admit that I wasn't really excited about coming up and teaching today because whenever uh, there's a message on sex or money, I, I always get the, you know, pull the short straw, right? <laughs> You know, oh, I have Elsog talk about that. All right. Um, and really, it's a subject that is really personal. <laughs> you know, it can almost seem self serving for someone like me who, uh, to stand up here and say, give to God's work. And so for me, it's, it's really a hard thing and it's kind of nerve wracking to actually stand up in front of you and talk about this. But as I was praying over the last few weeks, knowing that this was coming up, I really felt that God has something to say to us today. And it is. It is personal. Money is very personal. With the exception of those who brag about how much they make, you know those people, most people keep their cards pretty close to themselves. We don't publish our checkbook and our, our bank statements to everyone to see. We don't show people what we spend on. We don't share how much we really have or the real uh, times that we've totally failed financially. You know, it's really personal. I know that if someone were to look at my, first, my personal financial statement, I'd probably be pretty embarrassed by some of the things you would see on there. But there's been times that I've lost everything. I've lost all my money, every single thing. And then... If you'd look in my checkbook or my bank account, you'd also see some pretty interesting things over the last five years. You'd, you'd probably see some, some deposits that were like, what in the world is that? It would seem unbelievable. And I, the only thing I could call them is this, miracles. <laughs> miracles that have totally bailed my family and myself out. And how interesting is it that we had planned this service six months ago when everyone was still happy and buying and stuff and everything. <laughs> and now we're teaching on money today. I mean, just watch the news, listen to the radio. Anyone, does it make anyone depressed? <laughs> Seriously. Our country's in a recession. People are losing their homes. People are losing their retirement. People, we're, some people are saying, we're on the verge of a depression. And money and the economy is the number one story on every single news program. So how interesting is it that we're addressing that today? Many people have a fear of losing their money, and some of you may have. People are losing their jobs and their income, and it's a scary time for many people. I remember five years ago, I said yes to God. I, had, I felt a real strong feeling of what God wanted me to do next. I said yes to God. Not long after that, I lost my job. And I had to go get another job. And the job I got was 60% less than what I was making. Now, when you're living pretty much on your means, and your income drops 60%, it gets a little scary, doesn't it? Just a tiny bit. I know what it feels like to have lost jobs and to lost income and to have to cash in 
the, all my savings in retirement to just make ends meet. I've been there. And some of you have been there, and, and maybe you're there right now. I don't know if you've ever read anything on birth order, bo- birth order books or anything. There's this famous author, Kevin Lehman. He writes birth order books, you know, the characteristics of the firstborn and the middle child and the, and the baby of the family. And about 10 years into our marriage, my wife starts reading this book on birth order. She gets to the part on, on babies of the family. And uh, it says in the book, two babies of the family should never marry each other, okay? Because they will set themselves up for all kinds of financial woes. My wife and I are both babies of the family. So a little too late on the information there for us, right? A little too late for us to, to kind of change the ways we're doing things. And to be honest with you, many times in our life, we've like had nothing and, and have, have just been like, why can't we get our finances together? Well, because neither one are paying attention because we're kind of babies of the family kind of thing, you know, right? <laughs> and I've totally been there. And then... I was thinking about that just even this morning. I thought, but there is a real positive to us both being babies of the family. It's because we've been willing to say, yeah, I'll take a job at a much lower wage to do what God wants me to do. Because we're both like, ah, take a risk, whatever. What if we lose everything? We've lost everything three years ago. Let's lose it all again. So so, uh, losing your money is, you know, something I'm really good at. I don't know if that's good or bad. So you might be asking yourself, why is this guy up here talking about money then? <laughs> right? And I know I've heard messages on money, and I've heard messages on debt-free living and all that stuff, and I always feel like a schmuck because I can't ever get to that point, you know? But the Bible has a lot to say about giving. It has a lot to say about other things as well. So the Bible probably talks a lot about believing in faith, talks a lot about prayer, talks about love, it talks about giving. But get this. So the word believe, you'd think that would be a pretty important part of the Bible, right? Believe, you know? It's all about faith. Believe is mentioned 272 times in the Bible. The word prayer, how much prayer is really important, isn't it? Right? Think about it. Come on, it's church. Come on, prayer is really important. Prayer is mentioned 371 times in the Bible. Love, how important is love, right? Jesus said, love one another, love your brother, love God. Love is mentioned 714 times in the Bible. When you get to giving, giving is mentioned 2,161 times in the Bible. So when, when we talk about generosity and giving, it is a major theme of what God is trying to communicate to us through his word. Not what I have to say, but through his word. 16 out of 38 parables that Jesus taught were about money or possessions. Almost half. Money is the second greatest theme in the Bible. And one out of every 10 verses in the Gospels is talking about money or possessions or refers to them. And when it comes to giving, losing our money, or especially giving it towards God and giving generously, people come up with a lot of excuses. And I've used some of these, so I'll share them with you this morning. (laughs) Well, I'm a student. I don't really make that much money. I'll, I'll give when I start my career. Or I have too much debt. I don't have enough to give to God. Or I'm a single parent. And I, I'm really, uh, things are really tight. I, I can't give to God. Or I'll give when I make more. I don't know if any of you use that, use that excuse but I'll give when I make more. I found the interesting statistics when I was studying for this. That the more people make, the less they give. To charities, churches, whatever. The more people make, the less generous they are. That just shocked me. It shocked me that the people who make millions of dollars a year give a very tiny, small percentage of that to charity 
and keep all the rest to themselves. Or if I give to God's work, then I, I won't have enough for myself. It's an excuse as I've heard. So the Bible says a lot about losing our money, and we're going to be talking about th- that today. And when I, when I thought about this series too, turning your Christmas upside down, this whole series isn't just about Christmas. It has some Christmas principles, but it's really a lifestyle principle that we're going to be talking about this month. Luke 6.38 is really the main statement, the, the main scripture for today. I want us to look at that. It says, this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Very interesting verse. We're going to talk about this day. So I, I, brought, I brought a little illustration. You know me. I'm always bringing something out. All right. So I got this barrel here. All right. You know, and I got, I got a couple other barrels too here. Other couple other containers. All right. Here we go. We'll start with this right here. This, this represents the totality of everything you own. Okay? Does that make sense? This is your life. Everything in this barrel is your life. Your family, your finances, your cars, your houses, your personal possessions, your DVD collection your Xbox 360. It's all in here, okay? Everything you own is in this, so this barrel is you. It's your life, okay? All right? We're going to talk about that today. And we're going to talk about some principles of giving as well today. And one of the principles you hear about in church a lot is the principle of the tithe, right? Okay? So this bucket, this red bucket here, so this is a this is a 55-gallon bucket, but we're going to pretend it's 50 because it does, the math doesn't just work, okay? I don't know why they make them 55 gallons. I asked the bucket guy who I borrowed this from. He doesn't know why either. So anyway, 50-gallon bucket. So this is a 5-gallon bucket, so you do the math, 10%, right? And you hear this, you hear this principle a lot in churches that the, the 10% is the tithe, and it's a real principle that's, that's strewn throughout the Bible and talking about giving and generosity towards God. And what God is really says is, give the first fruits of everything you make. And the tithe in the Old Testament, it was kind of like this. It was very agricultural, okay? So people would bring in 10% of the grain. They'd bring it into the temple. They'd bring in 10% of their flock. They'd bring it into the temple. They'd bring in 10% of the gold that they made. And they'd bring it into the temple. Why? So that the work of God could continue on. And what would the priests do? They would make the grain into bread and they would eat it. And, and they would kill the, kill the animals and they would eat them. They would take the gold and buy whatever was needed for the work of God and the worship of God to continue. That's, what, that's the Old Testament principle. And God, God says, okay, this is what it is. Give the first of what you have. The first 10%. Sometimes even more, but 10%. It's a, it's a biblical principle that God sets up in the Old Testament and it continues into the New Testament. So God says this. I want you to look in, in Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. This is an Old Testament prophet. But here's what he says. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. That's one of my favorite verses of the Bible. As God says, test me, wouldn't you like to give God a test? Like, how many times has he tested us? Seriously. Let's give him back one, right? All right? (laughs) Test me in this. Says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room for it. 
I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and vines of your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. God says, if you take this, and you pour this out, and you bring this to me, there's a principle. He says, I'll open the floodgates of heaven. Think about that. If you, I poured this on you, you wouldn't consider that a flood, would you? Would you really consider that a flood? You wouldn't consider that a flood. You'd, you'd be drenched. But it wouldn't be a, considered a flood. God says, I will flood you. Just live by this principle alone, just this principle, I'll flood you with the blessings of heaven. And I thought about that today. I thought, my five-gallon thing of this, if I just gave that to God, and his blessings were poured out on me, which one would I rather have? Keep this for myself or have this blessings from heaven? It's just a thought. When I was in Detroit, I was a children's director at a church, and we did this bus ministry. And we would go down to different neighborhoods and pick up people for church. Most of them were kids, but oftentimes parents would come along. And we'd get aunts and uncles, and about, three, about 300 people a week we would bring into church on Sunday morning. they get to experience our children's ministry and our adult ministry. And interesting people came on. And then once every summer, we took a week, and we'd do an evening event. And so we'd send the buses out. Well, that night, we were doing this event. We brought all these kids in on the bus, and all these other kids came in. And uh, a mom had come on the bus the bus driver obviously didn't notice this, but she was totally plastered. She was drunk as a skunk. And she came in, and she, came, and she started getting really belligerent. You know, hey, where's my kids? What have you done to my kids, you know? And she was, like, totally intoxicated. Well, we got her all settled down and everything. But here's the cool thing. She kept coming back on Sundays, bringing her kids. She's a single mom living in a pretty crummy rental in a, in a bad neighborhood. But she just kept coming. And she was hearing God's word. And she, all of a sudden, she realized, man, I need this in my life. So she became a believer. She put her faith in Christ. And not too long after, she heard about this tithe principle, this 10% first fruits thing. And, and she said, oh, if, I'm, if I'm supposed to be obedient to Christ, if I'm supposed to obey him and do what he asks, I guess I should start doing that. So here she is, a single mom doesn't even have a car, living in a crummy rental, starts giving her, her 10% to God. She says, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you in this. I'm going to test you. Okay, she did that. She comes in a couple months later. She goes, my company's all cutting back, and, and they never give raises to anyone. They gave me a 17% raise. I guess that thing really works. <laughs> And she was so excited. See, she didn't use the excuse of, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not really doing very well financially right now. I can't really give to God. And she just said, okay, I'm going to do this. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous man will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And you can ask yourself, am I feeling refreshed when I give generously? whether it's to the church or to charity or, or to just somebody on the street who's, who's in need. Does that totally refresh me? God says it will refresh you. You know, we have a lot of exciting things going on here at K2, and we continue to grow, and more and more people are coming in. But I don't know if you know this, but the church in America is totally in decline. More churches, hundreds of churches close their doors every single week for the very last time. They just close their doors. Thousands and thousands of pastors across America are working second and third jobs to, to just make ends meet while putting their full-time effort into the ministry of their churches. They're feeling tired. And I was like, why, why is that? Why, why is that happening? Why are so many God-given visions that God is giving people, and they're just going out. Why is it? Well, the reality is, the reality is this. That compared to this and this, 
This is what the average believer in Jesus gives to God. 2%. That's why I, you, some of you got that. <laughs> Very nice. Some of you got that. 2%. All right? All right? You get a little 2% milk. Okay? The rest of you catch on now? Okay. 2%. I'm thinking, that's not this. That's not this. It's 2%. So the average American Christian believer across America, including K2, the church, considers this. They're giving. And I was, I, I really questioned myself. I'm like, God, like, when did we get to the point where we said, this is just... This portion of my life, this is generosity. This is generosity. I don't know how we got there. I don't know where we, where we got to that point. So, when we live, we have a third bucket over here, and this is your life, right? Now, when we live by the Jesus principle of generosity... The Jesus principle of generosity, this is what it is. Jesus principle of generosity says, you take your life, you take your life, all that you have in here, your kids, your possessions, your Xbox 360, whatever you have, you take your life. You be willing to do this. You be willing to take your life and turn it upside down and pour it out. If you're willing to do this, man, all this other stuff, that seems easy. That seems easy to do. When you say, okay, God, I will turn everything upside down. I will be generous with my whole life, not just with my finances, with my time and my energy. Everything I have, I give to you, and I pour it out. Now, I ask you this. Using this principle, if you pour this out and God floods you, what happens when you pour this out? I don't know. Like a super flood? Like, I, I don't know what, what's, what's bigger than a flood. I'm just telling you, Jesus said, with whatever portion you pour out to me, I'll pour it back on you with the same measurement. So, eh, you know, like, think about it. Is this the kind of blessing you want from God? Yeah, you might get a little wet. Yeah, your clothes would definitely get wet. Do you want this kind of blessing from God? That's kind of like, you know, getting the Gatorade at the end of the game, you know, the coach gets the Gatorade. Man, do you want this kind of blessing from God? To give your life for Him. Everything you have is His. I don't know. You can answer that question for yourself. We're going to look at a few scriptures this morning about generosity and what generosity is all about. Because it's just not about this. This is, just, this is just a part of it. It's not about this. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. Give Him the first. Give Him the best. That means generosity is all about our love for God. That's what it is. It's about our love for God. Generosity is also about our trust in God. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. It was like that verse was written this week, wasn't it? <laughs> Do not put, tell people who have, who are rich, that's all of us. I mean, we're, we're all blessed compared to so many people in this world. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth. All we've been hearing about lately is hope, 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 right? And hope is great, but don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And if we put our trust in money, in finances, good luck. That's so uncertain. You could lose it like that. You could gain it like that. 
Generosity is about our trust for God. It's also about our lifestyle. In the next verse, I find this very interesting in this very next verse. It says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So it's not just about command the, those who have to give, but it says also have them have a lifestyle, command them to have a lifestyle of generosity, that they give in good deeds, and they give in the things that they do, in the things that they share. And generosity is also about the future. In verse six, chapter 6, verse 19, the next, very next verse, it says, In this way they will lay up for themselves treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. As I studied these last few weeks about this, for this message, I was astounded at how much generosity and giving towards God and His work was tied to eternity. How much it was tied to eternity. That when we're generous towards others, it makes an eternal impact. In 1 Timothy 6, it says, it lays up an eternal foundation. An eternal foundation. Think about that. And that when they discover, when you discover generosity, and when we discover what being generous with our whole life is, what happens? You discover what true life is. And I believe that Paul here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 is referring to eternal life in this age and in the age to come. You understand what real life is. What real life is. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, generosity is about maturity. It's about maturity. Since you excel in so many ways, you have so much faith, such gifted speakers, such knowledge, such enthusiasm, such love for us. Now I want you to excel also in this gracious ministry, this gracious ministry of giving. Paul says, yeah, excel in love, absolutely. Excel in faith. <laughs> excel in your knowledge. You better be growing in your knowledge and your faith and, and all those things. But don't forget, also, excel in the gracious ministry of giving. I think we've forgotten how to excel in that as a culture and as a group of people. There's two stories in the book of Luke that I want to look at today. And they're totally, they're all about this. These two stories are all about this. And they happen right very close to each other. And, and every story in the Bible, Jesus was using as a, as a teaching tool for his disciples. Because they were all standing there watching him as he's talking to different people. And he's talking to them about this and that. And, and they're, they're peering in. So I want you to just peer into this conversation, these two, this conversation that Jesus is having and this observation that Jesus makes. In Luke chapter 18, it's a story about a, a, a rich ruler who comes to Jesus. It says this, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And the rich man says, oh yes, all of these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. Then Jesus said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. And I want to stop right there. Here's what Jesus is saying. This man says, I've obeyed all the commandments. I'm, I've been a very good person. I've, I've, I've always, ever since I was a youth, I've, I've done exactly what God has said to do. 
This isn't part of the text, and I'm just adding this in. But I have a feeling he's also thinking, yes, if he, if he would keep all the commandments, he would probably said, I do this. I give of my tithe. I give my first fruits to God. I do that. I don't cheat on my wife. I don't, I don't give false testimony. I honor my parents. And I do this. Absolutely. And Jesus said, oh, great. I'm so glad we have someone as good as you who wants to come on our team. Just one more thing. Just, just one more thing. Take everything you have, this, this possession, this thing you love, sell it all, and give it to the poor so that you can be destitute. Is that what Jesus said? Did he say, sell all this, give it to the poor so that you can be destitute? No. What did he say? He gave a total promise. He gave two promises. He says, sell all this, just sell everything you have, give it to the poor, so that you will have treasure in heaven, heavenly, eternal treasure. And then you'll be free to follow me. Two promises. You'll have treasure from heaven. Second promise, you can come follow me, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. When he heard this, it says about the man, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. And Jesus looked at him. Now imagine the disciples standing around listening to this, right? Jesus looked at the man and said, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. How sad. Because this container is nothing compared to the riches that God wanted to pour out on this man. And he just walked away from Jesus. He's like, ah, I think I'll keep my stuff. Uh, I don't want to go that far. But it's interesting that, that after this, Peter, Jesus' closest disciple, he said to Jesus, well, well, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? Come on. We left our houses and our families and, and our possessions and our boats and our, and, our, and our business. We left everything to follow you, Jesus. What's in it for us? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. And the thing I love about Jesus is that almost every time he starts talking, he says, I'm telling you the truth here. Come on. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. He says the promise for you guys is the same as the promise for this rich man. Blessings in this life and in the life to come. And eternal life. See how the giving was tied to eternity? That our generosity and the amount of it is tied to our eternal foundation? It's unbelievable. Three chapters later, Jesus is sitting down in the temple. He's sitting down in the temple with his disciples, and they're watching people bring in their offering. And let's pick it up right here in, in chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow who put two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything she had. And what this teaches me is that it's not about the size of our possessions. The rich man had a, had a giant bucket of stuff. The widow had barely a handful of coins. Yet, the rich man decided, I'll keep all my giant bucket of stuff. And the, this widow decided, I'll give everything I have to God. God. She knew something that the rich man didn't know. 
She knew that if she gave everything, he would give everything and more. She understood the principle of generosity. See, the type of blessing that we receive from God is directly proportional. (laughs) Not to the size of our bucket, but to the position of our bucket. The bucket in this position can only collect and keep. When our bucket's up, it can collect and keep. You can still pack stuff in there, you know? You know, there's always room for a little bit more, right? <laughs> right? Our bucket can pack and keep, and we can keep it in this position. And we can keep everything in it. But the challenge that God's asking us, I believe, today, and is asking every believer, is to say, change, this, change the position of your bucket. Not to keep and collect, but to pour it out to hold it upside down. Turn your life upside down. Because when you turn your life upside down and you empty all those things and you say, I'm not going to hold on to these possessions like they're mine. No. I'm going to offer them to God. I'm going to turn my life upside down and give this to Him. What happens? Man, when we put that bucket back down... If I'm a believer and I really truly believe what God is saying in here, he's not going to leave our bucket empty. He's not going to leave our life destitute. He's not going to leave us in a place, oh, thanks for all your gifts. Now I'm just going to leave you to be totally destitute. Absolutely not. He promises us and he says, test me in this. If you give, I'll tell you this. I will pour out blessings that you cannot contain. Jesus said it again in Mark, in Luke 3, or Luke 8, where we read it today. He said this, he said, Given it will be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together. It will be overflowing, it will pour into your lap. You cannot contain what God wants to give to you. It's the principle of giving. Now, if you're taking notes, or if you're not taking notes and you have a pen, I want you to write something down, because... Because you may say, ah, oh, this is Dave, he's just full of it. And half the time I feel like I am. I want you to do some self-research, some self-study. I'm going to send you to a website, okay? All right? I found this to be an incredible resource. It's generousgiving.org. Here's the cool thing about this website. They don't ask for any donations or anything. They just are trying to share the information about generous giving and what it can do and what will happen if we are generous givers. Generousgiving.org. It's just all one word. It lists all the scriptures. You can do scripture Bible study, all the scriptures that are about giving. It lists all the excuses why not to give to God and all the answers on why he should. It, 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 will, give, it will send you to all kinds of different resources. I thought it was incredible. But here's the deal for today. Here's what today comes down to. It comes down to these questions. Do I trust God that if I turn my life upside down that he will fill it back to overflowing? Do I trust him? Do I trust God that if I give him the first fruits of what I have that he will pour out back on me, spiritual, financial, all kinds of blessings that I can't even contain? Do I love God enough? Do I love God enough that I would be obedient to what, do, what he's asking me to do when it comes to being generous? And is my heart in the right place? Is my heart in the right place when it comes to losing my money? that I am willing to hold my life upside down. The principle that Jesus said is, whatever measure you use, God's going to measure it back to you. That's his promise, and that's his gift.